going to be in Colossians chapter 2 today. We're in the book of Colossians. This is our fifth, sixth, fifth or sixth sermon in the book of Colossians. It's in the New Testament. If you don't have a Bible, there's some on the ends of your row. You can grab those. Um, use the table of contents if you need to. You can also Google Colossians, C-O-L-O-S-S-I-A-N, chapter 2, and we will be uh, looking at that today together. It's been a fantastic series, and we're really excited about continuing to look uh, at the Bible together. That's what we do here at Sedaris. So I want to give a shout out. We've got one week left in our Alpha course, which is a course that sort of introduces the base, 10 basic tenets of the Christian faith and lets people wrestle with that, ask questions, bring their own experience into it. And we've invited uh, some of those Alpha people to come join us and just see what church is like so that next week when we talk about what is the church, uh, they can bring their questions and experiences here. So welcome to those of you who are from the Alpha Course. We're glad you're here. Several of you I see and uh, love that you're here with us considering just like we do on Thursday nights at Alpha. So it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Uh, let me pray for us and then we'll get into the text. Father God, thank you for this time, for the space, for these people. Uh, we do thank you for what You have begun this new creation of marriage in Mark and Megan's life, God, that they might uh, be filled by your spirit, uh, that you'd protect them, and that you might use them mightily for your kingdom and your glory in this city uh, for many, many years and decades to come. Uh, I pray that for my friends here as well, that they would allow the spirit of God to fill them up so that they might be sent out and used by God to bring glory to the name of Jesus, the name above all names, who reigns even now from heaven. So we pray this uh, mightily. We pray for the Spirit to fill us, both as speakers and listeners, that we might see what you have for us in this moment towards those ends. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here we go. So if you don't know this about me, um, it won't take long to figure this out. I love philosophy. I love it. I love philosophy. Descartes, Aristotle, Plato, Pascal, Kierkegaard, I love philosophy, and and in seminary, I got as much philosophy as I could. Of course, theology, which is a bit different than philosophy, but also philosophy. I I loved it. My my favorite professor is a guy named Douglas Grotheis. Shout out, Doug. (laughs) He does not listen to my sermons, by the way. He's he's here. I'm here. He's he's a big timer, Um, but maybe. So, hey. (laughs) I just love him, and I audited every class because I, I only had so many elective credits, and it's always good to audit philosophy classes because it's a lot of reading, so if you don't quite get to it, you know, you don't get tested on it. But, so I audited class, sat in probably six or seven philosophy classes that he was teaching. I just, I, 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 I love philosophy, and uh, of course I love theology. It's what I studied and, and, and what I, I do is I think about God and I try to articulate the truths about God. That's what theology is, the study of God. Uh, but philosophy is great as well, and I love it. And in today's passage, what we're going to see is Paul telling us and warning us about the philosophies of the day and how we are rightly to appropriate them. Now, listen to me. I love philosophy. But by the end of the sermon, you might be scared of philosophy. You should be. It's like a healthy fear, right? It's like swimming in Florida, crocodiles, it's like a healthy fear, but don't don't be worried about it, I love philosophy, I want you to love philosophy, I want you to love the life of the mind, I want us as Christians, if you're a Christian in the room, to to really think about outthinking the world for Christ, because you see, Christianity is not contrary to the mind, Christianity makes, in my opinion, the most sense of all the philosophies of the world. It actually makes sense of the existential reality in which we live, and it's wonderful to know God and walk with Jesus. So I love philosophy, but there is some warning, and we'll see that today. So I want to do this real quick, and it won't be as quick as I just made it seem, but I want to start at the beginning of the letter to the Colossians, because here's how these letters work. They would have been read in one sitting, 
It's not like we've sort of, we, sort of, we sort of break it up and, and dissect it, but they would have been read in one sitting. So I just want to, because we're making a big shift in the letter at this point, he's now moving to a new prong of his approach of, of, of what's going on, because there were some troubles in the church in Colossae, which is in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. It was a church that had been started by uh, a disciple and friend of the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul is writing a letter back to them to help them find life and health as a community. And one of the things he will write about in, in the chunk that we'll look at today is these philosophies that had sort of gained momentum and steam within the community that, that were contrary, or in addition to the gospel to which Paul proclaimed. And he says, you don't need this other philosophy. All you need is Christ. But, but, but to see his whole argument, I just want to read it together. So if you've got the, we're just going to read starting in verse 1, chapter 1, the very beginning of the letter. Chapter letters are, numbers are the big numbers, and then the verse numbers are the little numbers, so we're going to start in 1-1. We're just going to read it up to the point where we are today, so you can kind of see where this thing that he says today fits in his overall argument. Okay, you ready? Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So Paul and Timothy are writing this letter. He is a special leader within the church, which is why we have his letters. Paul says this, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world. It is bearing fruit. It is increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. Epaphras was the one who started the church. He was sent by Paul to start the church in this town of Colossae. Verse 9. And so... From the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Amen. He, that's Christ, is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation, meaning he owns it all. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things and in all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all him, to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, before God. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship of God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
Him we proclaim, warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom and, and we, that we might present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil and I struggle with all energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the fullness of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ in him whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order, the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught the first time you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving, and we're to today. And let's keep reading. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him that's Christ. The full, whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us in its legal demands that he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, And he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in the question of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are shadows of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and the worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up about reason by by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head. That's Christ, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to their regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to the things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom, in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Amen? This is the word of God. I mean, it's, I, I should just sit my buns down because that is powerful. I can just, I'm probably just going to get in the way of that now, but I'm going to give it my all because, you know, that's why you guys invite me up here. Okay. But do you see, you see what's going on? He starts by reminding them who Christ is, and then he comes back, he says, but you're hearing some other people teaching some other things, and and it seems like they're wise, it seems like they're rational, they're plausible arguments, they have the appearance of wisdom, but they're not what you need. What you need is simply Christ and Christ alone. And the enemy of walking with God, like like Ben talked about last week, Walking with him, being built up in him, being rooted in him. The enemy of that always is listening and following to other ideas that are inspired by the elemental spirits of the world. It's been like that since the very beginning. And elemental spirits of the world, we'll get to it in a second. This is anything, human or non-human, that come alongside and usually what they say, because remember, this letter is written to Christians, it's written to the church, not to those who are not yet Christians, if you're not yet a Christian, we're glad that you're here, but remember, this is written to Christians. This is in the church. What always happens is these spirits come along, and they don't tell you, stop following Christ, follow this. They just say, add this to it. Like, how much better would it be if you had Christ and you had this? So if you think back at the very beginning of the Bible, in the third chapter, 
which recounts the creation story when God made man and woman in his image and he's walking with them and they're intimate. Ben talked about this last week and they have this perfect communication and they're, they're living life together and then an elemental spirit comes in the form of a serpent and he doesn't say, leave God altogether. What's he say? Keep him around, but you too could be like him. I mean, think how much better your relationship would be if both of you had the knowledge of good and evil. You see, it's, 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 it's not so obvious. It's always just add a little bit to it. Eh, it'd be so much better. It'd be like equals, you and God. This is the way the philosophies of the day work. Well, just, you know, let's just bring God down a little bit and us up a little bit and we'll just walk with God and we can keep walking with him. But the enemy of walking with God is always following the philosophies of the elemental spirits, which just wants you to add something to life with God. Christ plus something. So let's look again here. Verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to, the, to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Do you hear it? Three according to's. Three according to's. Here's, here's what Paul is saying. Again, philosophy is not bad. But it can be dangerous because of these three according to's, getting these wrong. Paul says, philosophies of the world, and these can take lots of forms, not, not just philosophy like Descartes or um, Aristotle or something like this. I mean, this is other religion. Uh, this is other uh, cultural movements and ideologies. These are all philosophies of the world, okay? Philosophy is like a catch-all term for big ideas, ways of thinking, systems of thinking. They're dangerous if they are based upon, if they are according to the tradition of men and not the word of God. Just keep that in mind. What is the root of this way of thinking, the system of thinking? Is it based on the tradition of men or is it based on the word of God? The second according to, is it based on worldly wisdom? So when he says elemental spirits, elemental being earthly, right? And, and if you haven't been here with us, this is an important uh, just reality. The Bible teaches that there's two realities that coexist. There's the reality that we kind of see, feel, touch, the cosmos. We call that, it's the earthly, the elemental uh, elements that we can kind of see and touch. And then there's the heavenly reality, which is the greater reality. And what we've said is that when we rebelled against God, uh, we sort of tried to put walls up around our, this earthly existence so that we could be our own gods and make up our own rules and decide what's right and wrong and do things our own way. But we are actually still just living in the larger reality, which is the heavenly reality. So if we limit our philosophy to only the earthly reality, we should be cautious. We should just be careful because it is not wisdom that proceeds from the greater reality, which is heaven, to our earthly reality. And what God is trying to do, and Paul's getting at this, and you can go back to it and listen to the other sermons, he is in Christ trying to reunite the whole thing. He's trying to end the civil war. He's trying to remove the body of cancer. He's trying to put it back together so heaven and earth can once again coexist and we can walk with God, but that will take some serious work. And it started with Christ on the cross to make heaven and earth symbiotic again. So is, is the philosophy based on worldly wisdom only, or is it based on heavenly wisdom that God, again, bestows upon us in love that we might know greater truth than we can see and touch and feel with our own senses? And then third, when he says, but not according to Christ. So is it not based on Christ? Is it not pointing to Christ? Is it, is it not... Uh, pointing to him as that ultimate reality, as the king of kings, as the pivotal point of reconciliation. If it's not, if that's not ultimately where it's leading, ultimately where it's pointing, it is and has the potential to ruin 
you. And if it's not pointing to Christ, Paul will say, where is it pointing? Because all philosophy points to something. And this term, elemental spirits, so you have human tradition and you have elemental spirits, Um, and they're really connected, okay? But but, but if you study where this word is used in other ancient Greek literature, because the Bible's written, or the New Testament's written in Greek, uh, it's usually referring to local deities, okay? So these elemental spirits are, are local deities. So you might think, like, in a neighboring town of Ephesus, where Paul spent much of his time where Epaphras learned under Paul and then went to start the church in Colossae. Um, They had a local deity known as Artemis, and they built temples, and they had festivals for her. She uh, was a great goddess, a local deity, and people worshipped her. And what Paul will say, and the Bible will teach, is that um, these are, in one sense, nothing at all, Paul will say that, meaning they do not have the same power as God himself, true deity, But what lies behind them, what lies behind the worship of Artemis, are these elemental spirits. These personal, though not physical, spirits that move and shape people towards these man-made religions and philosophies. This This is the system of belief that the Bible teaches. This is the worldview that there are more layers to reality than what we can see and touch. And there are elemental spirits that tend to push people towards the worship of local deities. So, we need to know this. We have local deities. We don't have statues and temples to Artemis, but we build buildings and create organizations, uh, and we have festivals and we associate ourselves, associate ourselves with objects of worship that are no less dangerous, that are rooted in human philosophies, but they are driven along by elemental spirits. That's intense, what I just said. That's really intense. But I believe it's true. And if you don't understand, like Paul understood that when people went and worshipped Artemis, and they went to the temple, and they gave money uh, to, the, to her worship, and, and they went to public festivals where she was worshipped, and, and it drew people together, and, and people would associate themselves with her for improving their trade in the city because they were worshippers of Artemis. All of this stuff, at one level, those people are responsible to it, but at another level, they don't realize they're being driven along by the same elemental spirits that were at, in the garden saying, listen, you can have more, you can do more, if you just worship this other thing instead of the one true God. And what uh, we call that is these philosophies have juice. They have juice. You know what that means? It means they have powers that are beyond our understanding. It's like, wow, why does that thing catch fire so fast? Why does that movement, why is that ideology, why, why do these things catch fire? It's not just man-made. There are elemental spirits that are giving it juice. There are spiritual powers and authorities who have domain on this earth only because they've been cast out of the heavenly realm. But they have power and authority here, and they are personal, and they are against the rule and reign of the one true God and Christ the beloved son of God. But the good news is, there are also spiritual powers and authorities who are both in the realm of heaven and sent to the realm of earth that have more power than these powers. So so they've got juice too. Uh, Angels are real and they have power and authority in this world. God sends them to protect his people, to fight against those that would oppose the rule and reign of God. And then, of course, the Spirit of God himself, which we call the Holy Spirit, is, is at a whole nother level of power and authority and has authority over all the spiritual realm. But there's real juice. And you kind of think, uh, can somebody grab me a cup of water? Sorry, I'm, I'm about to have a coughing attack. Um, 
you think, oh, this is just man-made stuff, and we can just argue about this stuff, and, you know, the best argument will win, the best worldview will win, and, um, but we don't see this other thing happening underneath the surface. I mean, think of, um, for instance, Nazi Germany. Just a, thank you. This is an easy example that we all, that, that hopefully will make sense to all of us. Of course, human beings are making real human decisions, and there's personal evil in the hearts of those humans that are, are leading to these atro- atrocities. And, but I think you'd be foolish to think, if you just study it, that there's not something else happening there. Elemental spirits, which are creating philosophies that change the way people think, and so that they can do the kind of things that happen in Germany the first half of last century, less than 100 years ago, the way people were thinking about other human beings and valuing and the way they were able to systematically murder other people who they used to live next door to. What is going on? You think that's just our human ideas? I don't think so. There's a real darkness uh, that was a part of that season in human history and we have to address it because that power didn't just go away. Here's what I'm not saying. I'm not contending that to say the devil made me do it is a reasonable excuse for all your actions. I'm not saying that. Each and every human being is accountable for their own actions. Each and every community of people is accountable. You don't get to just say the devil made me do it. So I'm off the hook. But I'm also contending that to say the devil doesn't do philosophy is just as dangerous as not taking account for your own actions and the way you think. It's a foolish blind spot to believe that the devil is not in the business of creating new philosophies that lead people towards ungodly actions and ways of life and love in this world. So how do you know? How do you know if human philosophies and systems of thinking and ideologies and cultural movements, how do you know if they've got this kind of juice, this power and authority moving them along? How do you know if maybe through the elemental spirits a local deity is rising up? Again, hard to know. But I would assert to you You can look at the same deities in Paul's day and look at the same patterns of things that happen in our day. I've already hinted at this a little bit. So temples, buildings, and organizations devoted to this particular philosophy, including paid employees. So we're creating economic systems around the worship of a particular thing, a particular idea, a particular religion, a particular god, a particular idea. Are there buildings and organizations? Is there infrastructure being built around that? How did an idea get to that point? Just a really good idea? Or is there some juice to it? (coughs) Oh, excuse me. Are there identifying markers? If you would go into a house in Ephesus, Most people who worshipped Artemis would have a personal shrine so that right when you walked into their house, the first thing that you would see was a shrine to Artemis. And then you would know, oh, they're one of us. Oh, they're not one of us. Personal shrine, personal markers, identifying you. It could be a type of dress. It could be a type of jewelry that you wore. It could be uh, a way that you talk. I mean, there are identifying markers that become associated with a particular philosophy or idea or system of belief. Bumper sticker. You pay 10 to 20 grand for a really nice piece of machinery and you throw a sticker that won't come off on it. <laughs> What's motivating that? <laughs> Thinking about making some for Sedaris, by the way. So... <laughs> Again, the church, this, you say, well, the church does this. Yes, the church does this. We are philosophy. And you need to d- determine, is, this the, is the spirit of the one true God motivating this philosophy, this way of thinking, or is it another kind? 
because the church clearly has juice, right? They've got all these things I'm talking about. So did Artemis, and so do things in our city. And then the third thing that, that you almost always see with philosophies that have juice is public festival, that you get enough people stirred up that you create public festival. How did it get to the point where we literally shut down the city to have a public festival? It's got juice. Where's that juice coming from? And again, it can come from God, his angels, the spirit of God, or it can come from other similar spirits of the domain of darkness. But to think that things get buildings and days of the week and cities blocked off and that that's just because it's a really good idea is, I think, to choose to be ignorant to the realities of the spiritual world, which do, Paul says, undergird and move along philosophies of empty deceit. Now look at this word here. We're still only in verse 8. By the way, I'm preaching two sermons on this exact same text, so come back next week because it's just so full. So it's like I can't do it all in one sermon. So we're going to be in the same text next week, and I'm going to show you a different angle of seeing this, these same truths, okay? Uh, more detailed about how these actually play out in, in the specifics of religiosity or legalism and syncretism, okay? Verse 8 says this, See to it that no one takes you captive. This is the key. What does it mean to be taken captive by a philosophy? Not only knowing, oh, I think this thing has juice, which means there's a spiritual component to it, not to just be aware of it, but have I been taken captive by it? Do I know people that have been taken captive by it? Being taken captive here um, really means that you've become prey. The Greek word here means that to become prey of a particular philosophy. And uh, if you're going to become prey, it means that there's usually a hunter, right? And this gets back to this idea that we're not dealing with impersonal ideas. We're dealing with personal I, people who promote this and elemental spirits who push it along. And so if you think about this, uh, the right way to think it is Paul saying, hey, we are a flock. We are a flock of sheep. We are the church. We've come together around Christ. And now there are hunters in your midst false teachers who are seeking to snatch you as prey away from the flock like a wolf would come in and lure away the sheep. And this is a theme that you see over and over again in Scripture. So he's saying, don't be taken captive. So there's an active role that you have as somebody in the church not to be taken captive. You don't get to just say, ah, those wolves, so sneaky and so cute, sneaky cute. You don't get to say that. He's saying, your role is to not be taken captive. How do you do that? <laughs> How do you not become snatched away? How do you not become lured away? I mean, these are powerful, juiced up philosophies with powerful movements and organizations and temples and days. You know, this is how these philosophies work. How do you not just become swept away by them? How do you not become captive? Well, it's more than just being informed. It's more than, than just being in the know. We need to do four things. The first thing, first thing has to do with our eyes. We need to look. We need to look for isolation. Look at your own life. Look at the lives of friends who may be taken captive. Is it creating isolation? This is how wolves work. They isolate you. And when you indulge in movements or philosophies that are moved along by elemental spirits, you will always see isolation following it. Isolation from what? Isolation from the people of God. You might still have a favorable opinion of your church friends, of, of your Christian friends, of your Christian upbringing, but you isolate yourself. And so what you need to do is try to zoom out, look at your life, and say, do I see isolation? And if I see isolation, it's the first indicator that perhaps I've been or I'm about to be taken captive by a wolf. Always isolates. Never slaughters when other sheep are around. Always moves you outside. Does it in the quiet. 
The second thing, you got to think of your heart. Just know your own heart. Know yourself. Know your heart. What, what do you feel? This is a feeling one. What do you feel in your heart? When you indulge in the philosophies and movements of human tradition and elemental spirits, your heart and emotions tend to drift from Christ to other matters. So what does this look like? What stirs me? What gets me going? That means it has your heart. So when you hear, when you, when you see this, when you see baptisms, and you think that at least three, hopefully more people will give their life to following Jesus, if that doesn't stir in you, like your next favorite philosophy or movement, you need to just, maybe I'm being taken captive. Number three, keep your ears open. Keep your ears open. Listen to your growls. Listen to your growls. You know what I mean by this? Remember Lord of the Rings? Famous movie that I think they turned into a book. Uh, <laughs> um, Gollum finds this really great ring. A little, little, little bit like this. Hey, if you weren't at the wedding, Ryan made my favorite joke I've ever heard at a wedding. He said, now they'll exchange rings, and they've chosen this. Uh, do you know why they've chosen a ring? And you've probably always heard. I'm going to explain the joke, because I don't think everybody got it. It was so good. A lot of times, that, like pastors will say, it's a circle, because it's a never-ending love that has no beginning and no end. I'm making fun of myself, because that's usually what I say. <laughs> and Ryan goes... You know why it's circle? He said, because your finger's a circle. <laughs> I said, that's good. I was like, that's good. Okay. Well done, brother. Okay. That was so good. Well, Gollum gets this ring, and he puts it on his hand, because his hand's a, a circle, or his finger's a circle, and, and he gives him power, and he likes it, and then when people try to take away the ring, he growls. I mean, it's a really famous, if you've seen the movie, it's a really good depiction of, of him even wrestling with himself about this ring, growling at himself. He knows it's bad for him, but he loves it so much. What are, what, what are you, listen for your growls. When do you growl at people when they, when they try to take something away from you? What are you growling at? You're growling at the things of Christ, or are you growling at the things of human tradition and elemental spirits? Pay attention to your growls. Uh, and the fourth thing, your mouth, your mouth. Pay attention to your mouth. Pay attention to your word count. If somebody was just recording your life and everything that you said, and they did a word count of the amount of words that you spoke about Christ versus the amount of words you spoke about some other philosophy or ideology or political movement, what would they think ruled your life? Pay attention to what comes out of your mouth, your word count. There was a very, very successful church that, that was over um, in Woodenville, and they, they got a big following of people, and they had many multiple satellite campuses, and, and somebody from that church came over to our church, and, and she really saw the writing on the wall uh, long before. Now, now that church has sort of diminished in a lot of ways. Uh, and she came back years before this happened, and we said, well, why did you leave that church? At this point, I didn't even, I mean, I would send people to this church. And she said to me, she said, I just realized after about three or four months that they stopped talking about Christ. They stopped singing about Christ. They stopped talking about him. They talk about all sorts of things related to him that are impacted and led by his love, but they never mentioned Christ. And it was a really profound thing that she noticed this and said, I can't go to this church. They're not talking about Christ. They don't say Jesus out loud. They talk about all the things Jesus cared about, about social justice, about loving people, but they never mention his name. It's a word count. She paid attention to the word count and said, uh-oh, and she saw it years before. What, what I now see is, oh, wow. They had moved Christ out of the center of their philosophy, and they'd moved something else that seemed good. They had a high res respect and reverence for Jesus. They just stopped talking about him. 
as though he was the center of why they existed as a church. Human philosophies and ideologies that seek to take people captive can be super obvious, like worshiping Artemis in Ephesus. She has a temple. It's obvious. It's a local deity. Or they can be super inconspicuous, super hard to see. Like what? Like the cult of positivity. To be a good Christian, you must be perpetually happy. That is not Christianity. That's the cult of positivity. That's a Netflix series, The Secret. You seen that? Think good enough thoughts and good things will happen. That is not what Paul taught to the Colossians. Like the cult of success, to be a good Christian, you must be rewarded by God with athletic or artistic influence, by career success, financial success, material success, you name it. That's the cult of success. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hard to see that, though. Doesn't doesn't God want to give good gifts? Yes. But have I slipped into the cult of success alongside Jesus? The cult of education. To be a good Christian, you must be intellectually elite, well-informed. You must have a wealth of information and data. I don't see that. But man, that one is powerful. Where? Our church. Let's not be taken captive by it. You do not have to go to seminary to be a leader of God's people. Like the cult of cultural transformation. To be a Christian, you must change the culture in which you reside. It's politics, politics, it's ethics, it's economic systems, it's social structures. Listen, Jesus cared about those things and we should want them to. But to say, to elevate them to The place of Christ, that you can't be a Christian unless you transform the culture, is to radically misunderstand the words of Jesus. Jesus will radically transform every culture to be the culture of Christ, and he may or may not give you that influence in your lifetime. You should want it, you should hope for it, but to worship it is to worship something alongside Christ. It is not contrary to true Christianity to be positive, to have success, to seek education, to transform cultures, but the cult of Christ requires one thing and one thing only. Remember a few sermons back, to be a good Christian, you must suffer, but not just suffer, you must, most importantly, be able to rejoice in your suffering. This is the profound leveling of all humanity. All humanity can and will suffer. And all humanity can and will, if they choose, rejoice the work of Christ in the midst of it. We are rejoicers, first and foremost. That's what it means to be a Christian. Why? Not because of ourself, but because of what Christ has already finished on the cross. Did you pick that up? Paul gets back. Look at what Christ did for you. On the cross, you have been buried with him and you have been raised with him. It is finished for those who put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ. It is Christ and his finished work that allows us to worship well, which is rejoicing even in our suffering. It is Christ plus nothing. For salvation, for experiencing God, for maturity and fullness of life. It is Christ alone. It is Christ alone. It is Christ alone. Why, Paul says, look at verse 9, because in Christ alone, the fullness of the deity dwells bodily. In Christ alone, God and his fullness is there. You don't need anything else. You just need Christ. What do you think fullness means? Fullness, 100%. Everything you need. So any philosophy that tells you you also need to do this, or you also need to be this, or you also need to... No, 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 no. They're lying to you. It's empty deceit. It sounds good. It's plausible. You understand it. But it's rooted not in the truth of the gospel. It's rooted in something else. You only need Christ. Look at verse 10. 
and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Guys, this is such good news. These elemental spirits are real and they're powerful. They've got juice. But God and Christ are head over all other authorities. There's real authorities, but Christ is the head. So we need not fear. We lack no power if we are in Christ. We lack power if we add something to Christ and try to make a Christ stew. You just need the real deal. Complete salvation, and we'll get to this next week. If you read through 11 to 15, your sin is gone. The debt is canceled fully. Not Christ plus good works. It's fully canceled. Your flesh, that part of you which wars against the goodness of God, That has been put to death fully. You don't need to put it to death anymore except to participate in what Christ has already done. And all the salesmen of sin, of false philosophies, of false religions, of false ideologies, they have been exposed and put to shame. Look at verse 15. He has disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. That's in Christ. And here's the picture of a king coming back from war and he's dragging behind the processional into the city all those whom he has defeated. He's got their bounty, he's got their loot, and he's walking into the city, putting them to open shame so that you can see them for what they are, so they no longer hide in the shadows and isolate you and move you so that they might try to destroy you and keep you from the will and goodness of God. Christ has walked them right into the arena to open shame so you can see them for what you're all. Paul here is helping Christ to expose them so that you know sin's salesmen are a sham and you don't need them, no matter how good it sounds. If this is true, what's left to do? Again, we rejoice. We thank Christ. We praise Christ. We proclaim Christ. Christ alone becomes our anthem. And we don't add anything. Not other deities, not other works of the flesh, not other religious practices or exercises. We'll get into this next week not movements, and we avoid the peer pressure that the people in Colossae were feeling when they were put to shame by the elemental spirits who were moving people to shame them and pressure them into their philosophies. We say, I reject that shame in the name of Jesus. That shame you're trying to put on me, I reject it in the name of Jesus. He is all I need. Do not try to add anything to him, but that's how the elemental spirits always work, trying to shame people to add something to Christ. Stand firm, my friends, in Christ alone. When peer pressure comes, and it will, to take up new philosophies, stand firm, Christ alone. When the culture shames you, pounding on your door to take up the wisdom of the age, when it seeks to take you captive, And says, we are the conquering army, come with us. Do not listen. Ask them, are you with Christ and Christ alone? It's that simple. And it's really hard. And we just resound and refrain, my friends. In Christ alone, in Christ alone, I can do But one thing, and that is stand and suffer if necessary and sing aloud, in Christ alone my hope is found. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that we need nothing else. Thank you that you have disarmed the authorities, though you allow them to continue to, if they might, take captive people by philosophies of human tradition, But we know they have no power, no lasting power. We know that the victory is won, that on the cross you have canceled our debt, that you have put them to open shame, that that they are just grabbing for straws, that they might have some impact as their time of influence is coming to an end. God, help us to know that is true. Help us to discern with our eyes and our ears and our mouth and our feelings what is truly of you and what is not, God, and help us to stand firm in Christ alone for all eternity. In Jesus' name, amen.